Okay, everyone, as promised, um, <clears throat> 12 o'clock noon Pacific time, it's time for the real nativity story. And here it is. Now, for the most part, everybody on TikTok, I'm going to be off screen because I want you to see the screen more than I want you to see me and just listen to the uh, presentation. Um, <laughs> the real nativity story. So, Jesus said 2,000 years ago, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of himself, but whatever he hears, he will speak and will show you the things that are to come. Jesus was very clearly was withholding a, an entire body of knowledge because people were clearly not ready for it. These, he continues on in the same chapter and he says the following. These things have I spoken to you in Proverbs, but the time comes when I shall no more speak to you in Proverbs, but I will show you plainly of the Father. I will show you plainly of the Father. Jesus promised that there would become a time in the future when everything would be revealed. I would say, this is that time. Why would I say that? Why would I say something like that? Well, here's the evidence. Adam and Eve, as we know from the Bible story, boom, had a fall, right? They fell. God began a restoration providence right away. 2,000 years after the fall, Moses comes with the Ten Commandments. 2,000 years after that, Jesus comes with the New Testament Gospels. And Jesus was crucified and said that he would be returning again. Interestingly enough, each one of these epochs of time is about 2,000 years. Interestingly enough, we have just crossed over another 2,000 year marker. We are in the year 2023. We should not be surprised at all that there's some new expression of truth, that God is moving in the world like never before. God has always been trying to restore the ideal on earth. And the second coming of Christ, or the completed Testament age. We have the Old Testament, the New Testament, and the completed Testament age, the second coming of Christ. If you take the word history and divide it into two words, you get his story. Yes, that N250 will get you on the bus. Nonetheless, it tells us a little something. That maybe history is not just a random series of disconnected events, but actually God's work through time and events. All right. <laughs> I'm, I'm watching the TikTokers. Now listen, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to answer questions as I can, <clears throat> but for the sake of the continuity of the presentation, <clears throat> I may not be able to get to you too much, but hang with me. This is going to blow your mind. I promise you, hang with this. This is the traditional story of Jesus. Like I said, I'm going to be off screen most of the time because I want you to see the screen. <clears throat> this is the tradition. It's called the crash scene. The crash scene. Every church puts out a crash scene at the Christmas uh, celebration, right? So depictions of this event run the gamut from the spectacular and, and sublime to the absolute ridiculous and cartoonish, right? But we have to ask ourselves the question, what is wrong with this picture? What is wrong with this picture? Well, one thing, you got a cow here, you got a camel, three sheep, and a donkey. Now, I know this is just a representation of the birth of Christ. Nonetheless, he was apparently born in a barn. And there's the baby Jesus laying in a manger, mange, manja. In Italian, that means eat. This is the thing that animals ate out of. How does the Son of God end up like this? Has anyone really asked the question, how does, how does the Son of God end up in such a miserable situation like this? This is not an ideal birth. This is a very difficult situation. A very septic environment. You know, actually, amazing thing. And we have to ask the question, how did he actually get there? Why was not he not born in a more glorious situation, being the Son of God? Well, here in San Diego, we're at 32 degrees uh, north latitude. Israel is at about... Bethlehem is about 31. Pretty much similar uh, climate. In the winter here, it gets down in the 30s. We normally celebrate the Christmas celebration in wintertime. There's a lot of debate as to when Jesus was actually born, uh, but normally the, the entire planet celebrates it in December. None, needless to say, it's cold. <laughs> no matter what it is, it's cold. Right? So, how is it that Jesus could have been born into such a situation? 
you'll have questions. Good. Is that Caitlin Office? Good. We're waiting for your questions. Cool. To understand the scenario, we have to go back to beginnings. We have to research this. We gotta, it's like a puzzle. In the box, a thousand piece puzzle doesn't look like anything. It's like, oh, is this the parliament building in London? No. And when you put it together, it looks like the parliament building in London. So we have to go back to beginnings to understand how did Jesus end up like this? We have to go back to beginnings. And where's the beginning? The beginning is actually in Malachi 4 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the, great, the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. This is very important. Bear this in mind. Put this in your memory, okay? This is extremely important, the Elijah figure. Now, how is that going to be fulfilled? How is that going to be fulfilled? We have to follow this carefully, a piece at a time, a step at a time. Luke chapter 1, verses 5 through 17. There wasn't, stay with me everybody, there's a lot of reading, but stay with me, you're going to dig this. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias and his wife Elizabeth. They were both righteous before God. They had no child because Elizabeth was barren and they were both now well stricken in years. Essentially that means they are older. Elizabeth is really beyond childbearing years. They've been, they've been praying for a child for the longest time, but somehow she can't get pregnant and have a son. It came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. Can everybody hear me? Is sound okay? Sound okay for TikTokers? This is going on Zoom and YouTube very soon. Sound is okay, everyone? Okay. The whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the time of incense. This is very important. Remember this point. There are a whole multitude of people, a lot of people around this event. Boom, it continues. There appeared unto him an angel of the Lord. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Fear not, Zechariah, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. Interesting. So an angel appears to Zechariah in the middle of his incense uh, 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 ceremony and says, I know it doesn't look good. You guys are pretty old, but you're going to have a son. Surprise, surprise. You shall have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth, for he shall be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and to the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Remember that one too. Remember that one too. He shall be filled with the Holy Ghost. He will go in the spirit and power of Elias. Remember, we just read Malachi 4, 5, and 6. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. He shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, the heart of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Bang, there it is. So it could be that John the Baptist is the fulfillment of Malachi 4, 5, and 6. But Buffuna says, but, but that means Elias is someone other than Elijah, right? No, Jesus said in Matthew 17, 10, and the disciples asked him, Jesus, saying, why then say the scribes that Elias must first come? This tells you two things, two things, TikTokers. Number one, the, the disciples clearly knew nothing about scripture. If they're asking Jesus, why are the scribes telling us that Elijah has to first come? Two, the scribes are coming behind Jesus' back to Jesus' disciples and telling them, your boss cannot be the Messiah because there's no Elijah. And Jesus answered, said to them, Elias truly shall first come and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elias has come already. This is Matthew 17. John the Baptist is already dead by Matthew 12. And they knew him not, but have done unto him whatever they listed or desired. The word is desired. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. So Jesus is saying, Elias has come already. They knew him not. They have done unto him whatever they listed, whatever they wanted. John the Baptist is already dead. Jesus is lamenting the death of John the Baptist. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer them. Jesus is saying, now that John the Baptist is gone, I'm going the same way. 
Then it continues, verse 13. The disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. So John the Baptist is absolutely, yes, this is live. John the Baptist is absolutely the fulfillment of Malachi 4 that Elijah would come. What? That's right. You heard right. <laughs> Why would this be significant? Why is this important? Well, it's so important that Jews to this day at the Seder feast put out a cup for Elijah. 2,000 years later, the, uh, at the Seder feast, a cup for Elijah is put out at the Seder feast just in case Elijah shows up. And <laughs> they also put out a chair for Elijah just in case. And they opened the door to to hail Elijah in case he's somewhere close by your house. How amazing. The Jews only uh, uh, institute a tradition if something dramatic happens in the culture. Sunday evening marks the beginning of the Jewish festival of Hanukkah in December. Jews celebrate their victory over the tyrant king Antiochus and the rededication of the temple in Jerusalem. As the story goes, a small quantity of oil used to light the temple's menorah uh, miraculously lasted eight days. Now, the story had such staying power and such an Im impact and effect on the culture that the menorah became a national symbol. Something dramatic happened in the Jewish culture and that became a symbol of the country. It was so dramatic, right? Back to our story. Back to our story. We're talking about Luke 1 where the angel is appearing to Zechariah and uh, telling him that he's going to have a son that they've been waiting for. The story continues. Luke 1.18 And Zechariah said to the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife well stricken in years. And the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel that stands in the presence of God, and I'm sent to speak unto you and show you these glad tidings. And behold, you shall be dumb and not be able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed, because you believe not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. And the people waited for Zechariah and marveled that he tarried so long in the temple. And when he came out, he could not speak unto them. And they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple. For he beckoned unto them and remained speechless. And it came to pass that as soon as the days of his ministration were accomplished, he departed to his own house. And after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months, saying, Thus has the Lord dealt with me in the days where he, he looked upon me to take away my reproach among men. So in... in in ancient Jewish culture, it was, it was kind of an embarrassment to be an older woman without, a, without a, a son or daughter, right? So now she's happy because it's very clear that she's going to have a child. Walter, can you turn that heat off? Just cut it. Thanks. So this is really important now. Zechariah doubts the angel, and the angel says, <coughs> you will be dumb. In other words, he's taking his ability to speak until these things will be performed because you believe not my words. Remember that. That's very important. That figures in very large into the story. It continues. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God into a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph in the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. The angel came in unto her and said, Hail, you that are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you amongst women. And when she saw him, he was, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great and be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom shall be no end. So this is when the angel visits Mary. Can you check on Zoom people? If anybody's come in. Thanks. So we've got all kinds of revelations going on here, right? It continues. Then Mary said to the angel, she gets the revelation from the angel, and then the angel, she says to the angel, how shall this be, seeing as I know not a man, right? I know not a man. In other words, to have knowledge of someone in, in Old Testament and New Testament parlance meant to have a sexual relationship. So she, she had not, she said, I've never known a man. I've never been with a man. How can this possibly happen to me? The angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon you, and the power of the highest shall overshadow you. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of you shall be called the Son of God. 
And behold, your cousin Elizabeth, she has also conceived a son in her old age. This is the sixth month with her, who is called barren. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. And Mary, this is very important. Mark this one down too. Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into a city of Judah and entered into the house of Zechariah and saluted Elizabeth. Mark it down. And Mary arose in those days and went to the hill country with haste. That means she went quickly. She got the revelation from the angel and bam, right into the house of Zechariah. What's significant about that? It makes it sound like they walked right across the street and knocked on the door. But this is not the case. The distance between where she got that revelation in Nazareth and Jerusalem, where Zechariah lives, is 60 miles as the crow flies. There's no evidence she went with anybody else. <laughs> My understanding of the scriptures will be opened. It's open, wide open. Stick with me, you'll be open too. 60 miles all by herself. There's no evidence she went with anyone, right? It continues. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, now Mary has arrived at Zechariah's house, right? The babe leaped in her womb. This is Elizabeth's womb. Mary's not pregnant yet. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. She spoke out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And whence is this to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For lo, as soon as the voice of your salutation sounded in mine ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. See, Elizabeth's womb, right? In the Catholic Church, this is called the Magnificat. From 45 to 55 is, Blessed Lord, our, our soul, the, the throne of David, etc. They go on and on for about 10 more verses. Uh -huh. But the babe leaped in her womb. Now, mark this down. Boom. Mary abode with her three months and returned to her own house. What? Yeah, 60 miles back the other way. Apparently unaided. <laughs> Y'all know the counts of life? I didn't. <laughs> you might say, and justifiably so. Well, of course Mary went to Elizabeth's house to help her with the birth. After all, they were cousins. Luke 1.36 says that Mary and Elizabeth were cousins. So you would think that, oh yeah, she's going to go down and help her cousin with the birth, right? However, uh-oh, mark it down. Ready? Here we go. Luke 156. Mary abode with the three months and returned to her house. Luke 157, the very next verse. Now Elizabeth's full time came that she should be delivered and she brought forth a son. Wait a minute, 56 and 57. Mary's gone out of the house before the baby is born. Mary did not go there to help with the son, with the birth. We have to ask ourselves some questions. Why does Mary leave Elizabeth's house perhaps days before the birth of Elizabeth's son? Is she ostensibly going down there to help? And there is no further record of any cooperation between these two families after that, save for Jesus' baptism by John the Baptist. Why are there no stories of the, the families of Jesus and John the Baptist together? Why, where's the gospel of Jesus and John? There's no other uh, the co collaboration between those two families. When you think... Joseph, Mary, Zechariah, Elizabeth, John, they all get these enormous, John gets a revelation that we're going to talk about in just a few minutes, but all four of the principles get enormous revelations from God, yet they never collaborate together. Mary leaves the house before the, the child is born. We have to ask ourselves a very important question, a difficult question. Is it at all possible that Elizabeth might have perhaps lost her faith? And if she lost her faith, more than likely Zechariah lost his faith too and suspected that something illicit might have happened between Mary and Zechariah. The only explanation for why those two families are never cooperating again, except when John the Baptist baptizes Jesus at the River Jordan, is because there was some kind of suspicion. Why? That's impossible, Buffuna says. Zechariah had an enormous revelation. Mary had a gargantuan revelation. Joseph was visited by an angel. And Elizabeth clearly knew of Mary and Zechariah's revelations. You would think this is true, right? Boom. But it wouldn't be the first time that huge revelations were so quickly forgotten under stressful situations, now would it? And stressful and pressure. 
Even John the Baptist doubted his own mission and the mission of Jesus. Blasphemy, you say. Well, let's, let's take a look. Matthew 3, 16. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. Quite possibly, one of the most dramatic revelations in the history of mankind Eight chapters later in Matthew 11, the following transpires. Now when John had heard in prison the works of Christ, <laughs> what? He sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Are you he that should come or do we look for another? What? <laughs> John heard in prison. We're going to answer that one in just a second. Jesus answered, said to them, Go and show John again those things which you do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them, and blessed is he, whosoever shall not be offended in me. Wait a minute. Still here and still listening. Great. <laughs> Stick with me. You're going to love this. <laughs> blessed is he whoever... Why would Jesus say that to John the Baptist? Blessed is he who is not offended in me. Jesus is saying, John, you're offended in me. You may not say that now, but we're going to show some evidence. Matthew 10, it continues. Jesus goes on. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Verily, I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there is not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Look out, here it comes, seatbelts fastened, thinking caps on. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. He that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, getting, in front, I'm getting in front of the wording here. That means the person that's in the kingdom of heaven hanging on by his fingernails is greater than John the Baptist. That tells us that John the Baptist is not in the kingdom of heaven. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, we are in Matthew 11, the, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if you receive it, uh-oh, this is Elias, which was for to come. John the Baptist is the fulfillment of Malachi 4, 5, and 6. Boom. Notwithstanding, he's as least in the kingdom of heaven. Again, the disciples asked him later on in Matthew, six chapters later in Matthew, the disciples asked him saying, Why then say the scribes that Elias must first come? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias shall truly first come and restore all things, but I say unto you, Elias has come already. They, have, they knew him not. They've done unto him whatever they wanted. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Then the disciples understood that he spoke to them of John the Baptist. John the Baptist is Elijah, and it's extremely important. So Jesus has testified to this no less than two times in the Scripture. Finally, in John 1, John the Baptist did meet Jesus, only at the River Jordan. That was it, for a brief time. And then they're baptizing on opposite sides of the river. This, pay attention, here we go, seatbelts fastened, thinking caps on, here it comes. And this is the record of John, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? Who are you? There's a dissension between the followers of Jesus and the followers of John the Baptist. And here they go. They asked, they, he confessed and denied not, but confessed, <laughs> what? I am not the Christ. For him to answer like that, they must have asked him the question, are you the Christ? In Luke 3.15, people wondered in their hearts if he were the Christ or not. There's still a group today that still believes that John the Baptist was the Messiah. They asked him, what then? Art thou Elias? They're asking him, are you Elijah? They were fully ready for a yes. And he said, I am not. John the Baptist flatly denied what Jesus said he was. 
They asked him again. They asked him twice. This is really important. Someone has to be unalived. TikTok, I can't say the K word. <laughs> Someone has to be unalived, right? It's either John or it's Jesus. One of them's got to go. They ask him again just to make sure. Are you that prophet? And he answered, no. Jesus said he was in Matthew 11 and Matthew 17 very clearly. Then said they unto him, Who art thou that we may give an answer to them that sent us? What sayest thou of thyself? In other words, who are you then? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. And they which were sent were of the Pharisees. What? What? John is clearly at this point confused as to who he is and who Jesus is. There's no doubt about it. There's no doubt about it. Where's the gospel of the adventures of Jesus and John? <laughs> Matthew 3.16. John baptizes Jesus and that's the end of it. Now we have to ask ourselves the question. How in the world did John end up in prison? How did that happen? What? <laughs> to understand this, we have to understand the following story, and we're going to take a little detour. We have to take a slight detour to illustrate this very important point. Very important point. Here we go. Boom. We're going this way. Now we're going to go this way, but then we'll get back on track. Don't worry. <laughs> this is a really important story. This determines the fate of John the Baptist, the fate of Jesus, and the fate of Israel and the fate of the world for the last 2,000 years. Jesus went into the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning, he came, and this is the story of the woman caught in adultery. Came to the temple, and the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what say you? This they said, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. Interesting. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. He didn't pay attention to anything they were saying. He knew what they were saying, but he didn't, he made, he, he let on like he, he didn't care what they were saying. He wrote on the ground like he heard him not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted himself up and said unto them, He that is without sin amongst you, let him cast the first stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted himself up, he saw none but the woman. And he said unto her, Woman, where are those your accusers? Has no man condemned you? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. <laughs> what could he have been possibly writing in the sand to make those guys drop their stones, pricked by their own conscience? He's writing in the sand. No one has ever known what he wrote in the sand. I know what he wrote in the sand. The only thing that could have possibly stopped the stoning was he was writing the names of women that those guys were involved with when they were ready to stone a woman caught in adultery at that time. It says, and they which heard it being convicted by the... He wrote something in the sand that convicted them in their conscience and they dropped their stones and they left the woman alone. It can only be that Jesus knew very well who they were involved. He just wrote women's names in the sand. <laughs> now, it makes sense. John the ba the entire nation of Israel is watching John the Baptist. His father has had a miraculous experience in the temple, right? He's renamed his he's, re he's named his son John in contravention to, to Jewish law, which should have called him Zechariah. But the angel said, "No, you will call him John." He's predicted as the Elijah. It's etc. So John the Baptist has an enormous following, 120 disciples. Israel's is watching them. Word of this incident must have gotten back to John. The people that were ready to stone that woman must have gone back to John. And in the ancient Judaic tradition, this is impossible for John's disciples to accept. To them, this clearly violates the Levitical law in Leviticus 20.10 that a woman caught in adultery 
should be stoned to death. Doesn't that make sense, TikTokers? <laughs> that makes sense? What does John do? What does John do in response? John is now in the unenviable position to have to now make a decision that unbeknownst to him will determine his destiny, the destiny of Jesus, Israel, and the world for the next 2,000 years. Oh my goodness. Here it comes. Matthew 14. John the Baptist goes right into the court of Herod the king. Herod laid hold on John and bound him and put him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife. For John said unto him, It is not lawful for you to have her. John is accusing Herod of adultery with his brother Philip's wife. Jesus just got done forgiving a woman caught in adultery. And he would have had him put to death, but Herod feared the multitude because they counted him a prophet. Herod the king was afraid to kill John because he knew he risks an insurrection in the area. In an outlying Roman province, he cannot have insurrections because his head is on the block. So, but when Herod's birthday was kept, the daughter of Herodias, Salome, danced before them and pleased Herod. Whereupon he promised with an oath to give her whatever she would ask. In another uh, gospel, it says even half of his kingdom. He was only to give her half of his kingdom. And she, being instructed of her mother, said, give me here the Baptist's head in a charger. The mother comes to her and says, I want John the Baptist's head. I don't care what you want. I want the, the Baptist's head on a charger. The king was sorry. Nevertheless, for his oath's, oath's sake, he promised. And them which sat with him at dinner, he commanded it be given to her. So he's at a big dinner with a lot of people watching, and he's promised his daughter up to half of his kingdom. But the mother wants John the Baptist's head. And he sent and beheaded John in the prison. And his head was brought in a charger and given to his daughter, and she brought it to her mother. And his disciples came and took up the body and buried it and went and told Jesus. Now, we can see just how enormous revelations can be quickly forgotten under pressure. Remember I said we we're going to take a little detour to show how enormous revelations can be quickly swept away under pressure. Back to Elizabeth. We're going back to Elizabeth's story. Now we got to deal with the birth of John the Baptist. Luke 158. Remember, we've had Zechariah getting the revelation from the angel Gabriel in the temple. He's struck dumb. As soon as he, his son is born, his mouth is loosened, and he sp speaks and praises God, and that story goes all throughout the, the immediate area. Her neighbors and her cousins heard how the Lord had showed great mercy on her, and they rejoiced with her. And it came to pass that on the eighth day they came to circumcise a child, and they call him Zacharias after the name of his father. His mother answered said, Not so, but he shall be called John. This is unprecedented. They said to her, There is none of your kindred that are called by this name. They made signs to the father. Remember, Zechariah still cannot speak. They made signs to the father how he should have him called. The father's going to name this child. He asked for a writing table. Back then they would use a wax table. If they couldn't speak, they would use a wax table to talk to each other. And he wrote, saying, his name is John. And they marveled all. They were shocked. And his mouth was opened immediately and his tongue loosed and he spoke and praised God. So this guy's been dumb for months. He cannot speak. As soon as he names his child, bang, he begins to speak. And he's the high priest. This is not just anybody. This is the high priest. And fear came on all that dwelled around them. And these sayings were noised abroad throughout the hill country of Judea. And all they that heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, What manner of child shall this be? And the hand of the Lord was with him. This is a big deal. This is something we remember this. This is so significant to establish who John the Baptist is. In the book of Luke, in a mere two chapters, jumps from John the Baptist's birth to his ministry at 30 years old. And as the people were in expectation, all men mused in their hearts of John whether he were the Christ or not. 
all the people in that area were thinking that John the Baptist was the Messiah. So dramatic was his birth, they were wondering if he were the Christ himself. In fact, as we saw before in John 1, the Levites sent priests out to ask him, are you really the one or not? They have to make, up a, they have to make a decision. Because there's, there's dissension in the ranks between Jesus' disciples and the disciples of John. Again, Matthew 17. The disciples asked him, when does, when does Elias first come? Jesus clearly says that John the Baptist is the Elijah promised in Malachi 4. Well, what's that got to do with this? You might say. We're getting there. <laughs> Luke 2. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was the governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth unto Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife. Mark it down. Espoused wife. They're not married. Being great with child. So what's happening here? Espoused is not married. Mary is great with child, but not married. This is a big problem in 2,000 year, old, year ago uh, Israel. So these guys have to go all the way from Nazareth <coughs> to Jerusalem to register. Matthew 1, 18, 20. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. In other words, privately. So it's clear Mary is showing pregnancy and they're not married. Otherwise, there's no reason for him to put her away. There's no, way to, no reason to hide her. She's showing pregnancy without being married. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take Mary unto thee, Mary, thy wife. Ah, interesting. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them at the inn. How could there possibly not be room at the inn? Anyone in their right mind would have made room somewhere in the inn for a pregnant woman about to give birth. Why in the world would Mary not have her baby at her cousin Elizabeth's house? It's only this far. It doesn't make any sense that, she, that, that that baby has to be born in a barn. Elizabeth, uh, <coughs> Mary's cousin is just a couple of miles away. They could have arranged to have the baby at her house. Could it be that a scandal was created at the time of Mary visit, Mary's visit to Zechariah's house and rumors persisted in the area until Joseph and Mary's arrival at the census in Bethlehem? Remember, the, the cities in, in Israel were not bustling metropolises like they are now. They say in Jerusalem, there might have been 25 to 40,000 people in that city. Word traveled fast. Word traveled fast. And it's the only explanation for why there's no cooperation between those two families. They all lost their revelations. They all lost their revelations, clearly. John the Baptist is the most clear example of that. He's in prison sending out disciples to ask him if he's the one to come or is there another. He just got a revelation in Matthew 3.16. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Big revelations can be easily lost. Again, we can show the estrangement of Jesus and how Jesus was considered a second-class citizen by virtue of his birth. Matthew 13, 55. Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And his brethren James and Joseph and Simon and Judas and his sisters? Are they not all with us? Whence then has this man all these things? And they were offended in him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is without, not without honor, save in his own country and his own house. For John 7, 5. For neither did his brethren believe in him. His own family didn't believe in him. Again, Mary had a direct revelation from the angel. Why didn't the family believe in Jesus? Joseph got a direct revelation from the angel. 
What is the problem with this family? Here's what it looks like. Now imagine yourself in, in first century Jerusalem. It's the relative image of Jesus and John the Baptist in the eyes of the people. John the Baptist, son of the high priest Zechariah. As far as they were concerned, Jesus was the son of a carpenter. John the Baptist had a miraculous birth in, in Luke 1. Jesus was assumed illegitimate by Luke 2, 5. Mary is great with child, not even married. So this, this stayed with Jesus. This image stayed with Jesus his entire life. He was like a pariah. People just assumed he was illegitimate. John the Baptist was schooled by the religious elite. The nation of Israel took care of John the Baptist because they thought he was the Messiah. So he got special attention, special education. There's no, no evidence that Jesus was schooled except by himself. He learned the scriptures himself and was teaching at 12 years old in the temple. But not officially schooled by, by the temple. John the Baptist was a ascetic. He was eating locusts and honey in the desert, wore hair shirts, telling people to repent. In Luke 3.15, they thought that he was the Christ. I can't make this up. I can't make this up. They thought he was the Messiah. Jesus forgave adultery in John 8. The Levitical law says a woman caught in adultery has to be stoned to death. Then John goes and accuses Herod in Matthew 6. As far as they were concerned, Jesus taught hate of parents. He said in Luke 14, 26, you have to hate your mother, hate your father, and follow me. In direct contravention to the Ten Commandments. Love, honor thy father and thy mother. Jesus ate with sinners, Matthew 9, 11. Someone even said, what good thing can come from Nazareth? This is ridiculous. How can there be a Messiah from Nazareth? And he claimed to be the fulfillment of the Old Testament. I am the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. And he was. Matthew 5, 17. God loves you too, Grace. <laughs> Thanks for being here. And the clincher. This is when Jesus was going to go to the cross. Matthew 9, 2 and 3. That you may know the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sin. Rise up, take your bed and walk. Your sins are forgiven. It says, who can forgive sin but God alone? The Jews went ballistic. Who can forgive sin but God alone? Right? So Jesus is in big trouble because his image is relatively small compared to John the Baptist. John, simply through the force of his reputation and authority, could have led everyone to Jesus and thus to the world in short order. If Jesus is the Son of God, do you think he could not have saved the world alive? Did he actually have to die to save the world? I would like to think that the Son of God on earth would be able to save the world. So here's what it looks like. Jesus and John the Baptist. John the Baptist has 120 disciples around him. The whole nation of Israel is thinking he's the Messiah. Israel is occupied by the Roman Empire. All roads lead to Rome. Boom. Rome is connected to the world. What if John the Baptist and Jesus together went this way? Would we be in a different world? I dare say we would. <laughs> there was a man sent from God whose name was John. This is John 1, 6, and 7. If you hear nothing else, hear this. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness. The same what? The man. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light. Who's the light? Jesus. Jesus is the light that all men through him might believe. Oh my goodness. John the Baptist was key to the success or failure of the mission of Jesus Christ. Remember, we are in a special time, boys and girls. God's revelation is ongoing, upward, and progressive. God never stays still for any length of time. Well, 2,000 years at a time. <laughs> but again, we've just passed through 2023. It means we're in a very special time where we should not be surprised that God is revealing new understanding. Right? So now, now does this story look a little bit different? This is not the enchanting story we thought it was. 
This is really sad. This is really sad. That the Son of God would have to be born in such a miserable situation. Do you think John the Baptist was born that way? <laughs> Not at all. John the Baptist was born in the middle of the temple. In glory. Right? So, this is a small part of a bigger presentation that I, I may do some other time. But uh, I think we'll let it uh, rest right there. And thanks for coming in, TikTokers. Uh, this whole presentation will be going up on YouTube uh, 